are you? So happy to be here with you this morning. I hope you are all caffeinated and excited because I'm going to cover a lot of uh, exciting and interesting content this morning. My name is Leila Jaralu. I am a designer and a sociologist and deeply passionate about how we can design a world that works better for all of us. I was actually named Champion of the Earth by the United Nations in 2016 as a result of my work. And so I wanted to share a little bit about how a designer ends up, you know, gracing the stage of the UN. Um, for me, what I've always tried to do is find ways of designing tools that help people make change. I've done that through lots of different things, different gamified experiences. I also have designed um, lots of different commissions for um, organizations around the world that are in also interested in sustainability and design. I run a design agency, which is um, pretty common, I think, for the audience who are listening to this. Um, and that's been a really exciting journey because the whole goal has been um, to see how we could use design as a catalyst for social and environmental change. I made this... Um, project called The Circular Classroom for Your Neighbours in Finland, uh, which is really about getting uh, young people, as we were just hearing from the last speaker, young people motivated around the future economy. And what the future economy requires is creativity on all fronts, but it also requires a flexible and diverse way of thinking about how the world works. And so we created this online toolkit that has interactive, experiential um, games and things that uh, young adults can do in order to think about the way products are made, how design and creativity can help drive us forward into the future. I was also commissioned by the United Nations to create a toolkit that helped address sustainable lifestyles and living. I'm sure we all know that um, our general everyday actions have impacts on the planet, whether it be the products we buy from the supermarket or the food we eat, how we move around our cities. All of these um, lifestyle choices have impacts. And so we created this mimetic reference of your hand um, and created a, a series of everyday um, disruptions that you can do in order to help bring about a more sustainable lifestyle. And I also run something called the Unschool of Disruptive Design, an experimental knowledge lab for adults where we teach people systems, sustainability and design as the tools for making change. And through this program, I have met thousands and thousands of creative people of all shapes, sizes, nationalities and backgrounds. And I have been so inspired by the creativity that exists right now for solving some of these big social and environmental problems that I think we are all fully aware exist around us. Um, for me, this is about learning to love problems. As designers, as creatives, as coders, as um, entrepreneurs, I'm sure you wake up in the morning just like me and you're like, okay, I see a problem, but my brain immediately wants to solve it. I want to figure out how to kind of get inside it and see what the inner workings are. And that to me is a, a skill that can be expanded out to people who don't necessarily have a design skill or craft. Um, because ultimately the future, the world that we live in, is defined by our actions today. And I truly believe that design in all its forms has the ability to help us design a future that works better than today. And most of you guys are working in experiences. You trade in the intangible commodity of either digital or physical experiences that ignite the mind and, and motivate action. And as we know, the world changes quite rapidly. And recently we've had this kind of massive transformation to the digital world. I mean, even more so right now, uh, given the results of COVID. And what's fascinating about this transformation is just how design has been used in both really transformative for positive outcomes and kind of also um, transformative and perhaps not so positive outcomes. This patterned um, dark design of using design and digital experiences to manipulate users in order to get what they want, whether it be hiding um, particular information so that it's hard to click a box to opt out of things. I mean, we've had policies like GDPR recently to really help protect people from some of these more insidious behaviors. But the ultimate thing is, is this what this represents is how easy it is for design to influence people. How we know as designers that we have the power and capacity to cognitively change someone's perspective and idea of how the world works. But not only designers, not only those of us who are designing experiences and creating products and services that interact with humans in the world, we as citizens of the world design it in every action we take. The economy ultimately dictates what we end up with. And those of us who are buying lots of stuff online are not supporting local communities, which will have an impact on our local community. 
So the planet has limits. That's one of the things that we know to be true. We live on one planet. So far, they haven't found any other life-sustaining planets in the universe. And so this beautiful, big, blue dot that we all live on is the home that we need to protect. And sustainability is really that whole encompassing idea that we can have an economy, that we can have growth, but in a way that doesn't negatively impact the ability of future generations to have the beautiful quality of life that we've been able to build to this time. And of course, yes, we have a lot of complexities at the moment that we're challenged by, whether it be COVID or climate change. But I truly believe that if we change the way we see the world, we change the way we exist within it as individuals and as members of this broader community, then we can actually really change the world to be better for all of us. And that is what the proposition of the circular economy is all about. So if you have sustainability is kind of like the big goal, like how do we live sustainably on the planet? And ultimately, if we could solve that problem, we could learn to live regeneratively, which is where we give back more than we take. But the circular economy is like a practical framework for how we go about doing that. And I'm going to explore that a little bit more with you today. Let me just explain why we've had to move to this circular economy. Humans, we live in a linear economy. We created a take, make, waste system where we go to nature, we grab resources, we cut them down, we dig them up, we shear them off a, sheep back, a sheep's back, or we pull them out of the ground in the form of oil, we transform them into usable goods, and then we buy them, and then we waste them. And then in that waste system, there's ultimately several, uh, several I guess, pathways, and I know that you guys are in Norway and you burn a large percentage of your waste for energy and you separate it, but of course that's not the practice all over the world, and we have landfills, we have um, a lot of waste escaping into the natural environment and ending up in the waterways. This linear economy is not sustainable because ultimately what it does is it ignores that all the, the beginning and the end of this system, there are all of these losses. Right. So when we design products, we have to pull on the invisible strings of the economy. Right. So we sit in our rooms and we figure out what materials or processes, whether it be a paper product or whether it be a digital product, is going to exist in the world. And that then goes and pulls on the, all of these imaginary strings in the economy. And then it goes out into the world. It exists in the world. And then somebody's responsible for its end of life. But that end of life, that disposability, is decided by the end user in most cases. And that's really where a lot of the issues occur in those two ends. So the circular economy is really about trying to find a way of bringing them together, of closing the loop, of finding a way to respect the natural world so that we don't destroy the systems that we need to sustain us, but also to add more value. Because ultimately, if we have all this waste and all of this pollution, we're just losing value from the system. And that's the reality. We live on one planet. Everything stays here. It doesn't go anywhere else except for space junk, which just kind of floats around orbits the planet. So everything that we create, everything that we've ever created still exists on this planet. That's mind boggling, right? And only 9% of all plastics ever produced since we kind of started with the plastic revolution in the 1950s has ever been recycled. 91% of it still exists, whether it be in our lives um, or whether it be in the oceans. Ultimately, the world that we live in, we have designed and it in turn is designing us. It's creating our culture. It's creating our identity. And one of the big issues I see is that we've got this big disconnect from the natural world. Of course, we all appreciate it. We go and spend time in nature. We know that we have to put nature in our bodies every day when we eat food. But our general day-to-day -day lives are so disconnected from the impacts of our actions and the way the natural world works. We don't see all the pollution. In fact, most of the pollution, the waste, waste and pollution are pretty much the same thing conceptually in the um, circular economy, is invisible to us, right? Of course, if you go somewhere where there's really bad air pollution, then you're going to be viscerally experiencing it. And most of us understand that when we put our trash out, someone's going to come take it and it's going to go somewhere and it may or may not um, have a negative impact on the world. But generally, our actions don't necessarily give us that immediate feedback to understand where all the impacts are occurring. So this concept of operating within natural systems is about being regenerative. So nature has this incredible system where everything in nature is designed to break down to give back new value to the system. It is regenerative by design. And that is one of the goals that we have in this using design as a transformation to the economy. And for me, this is a really beautiful thing because when you look to nature, of which we are all part of, you know, my skin and bones are made of the same thing as this beautiful flower, um, we are part of a system that is optimized to create life, maintain life, and a system that doesn't have a concept of waste. 
nature doesn't design waste, it designs life. So all of the things that are dead or break uh, are designed to break down and then give back the building blocks of life to the natural system. So here we are living in an economy that since the Second World War has really been an exponential growth economy. And at the same rate of exponential growth, we've extracted and processed resources at a rate faster than the earth can gobble them back up and make sure that they get reprocessed by the planet. And so this is called this idea of earth overshoot that we've ex we've kind of um, gone into the future capital of the Earth's resources. And actually what's fascinating about this is that until uh, 1990, and sorry, 2019, last year, um, we ha were really on a not a great trajectory in the sense that in the middle of each year, around about July, we had used up all the resources for that year. So this day was is called Earth Overshoot Day, and it happened in um, late July last year. And then this year, because of COVID and because of all the, the, the kind of transformation of economic activity, we actually bought back a whole month of time. So it's amazing to see how changes to the economy do directly affect the natural world. And none of us are immune to the reality and the pressing issues of climate change, of all the social inequality and the ecosystem destruction that we know is happening around us. I mean, right now, California is burning. I'm from Australia originally in January before the COVID crisis, you know, rocketed around the world. The whole of um, Australia's ecosystems were destroyed by wildfires as a result of climate change. You know, the United Nations has been working tirelessly to try and find ways of activating the global community, especially the business community, to figure out how to take action. And the Sustainable Development Goals, which I'm sure you're all aware of, kind of lay a pathway for that. They set us these kind of ambitious targets by, well, now we've got nine years left because it's almost the end of 2020, which I'm sure we're all very grateful for. Um, we have nine years left to figure out how to solve these problems. And so it doesn't just mean that individuals existing in society can, you know, do some recycling and somehow that solves the problem. You all have a job and the work that you do is actively interacting with the economy and therefore the natural world. We are all participating in the drawing of different materials and processes from this invisible economy or invisible systems around us that ultimately then has the capacity to create a more sustainable or an, a more uh, damaged environment. And so this to me is the really exciting thing, that it creates, it's this synergy that is required between all the different players in order for us to transform from this linear economy that is basically crappy and doesn't give us value. I mean, it gives us immediate things, right? Like that's the benefit, but it doesn't give us long-term sustainability. So how do we turn into a circular economy? How do we transform our world, our material world and our digital world and our own lifestyles so that we can address pressing issues like climate change? And I'm, I'm sure, um, the concept of climate change is not new to anybody listening to this, but the idea that there is this huge, big, invisible problem that we have to address or risk destroying what's called homostasis, which is the ability for the Earth systems to essentially regulate, like how our bodies regulate temperature. So when we're well, which should be most of the time, our bodies are at a stable temperature that makes all the bits inside us work. Whereas when we get sick, that gets disrupted and there's a, a the homostasis of our body is, is no longer able to um, meet that equilibrium. That's basically what climate change is. It's the, the planet getting... Um, enabled to regulate its temperatures so that we can maintain this important state of homostasis. And this is the thing, climate change, it's embedded in everything we do. Every single thing we do has an element of the climate change in it. And this to me is one of the most fascinating things. We are discussing this through the internet. Hello, internet. It has a physical impact. It has a footprint. Every single thing we do on the internet, the Google searches we do, the videos we upload, the things we store on our drives, they have a physical footprint because the internet requires physical assets, whether it be servers and energy and cooling systems in order to function. And so every action that we take uh, in our digital lives has an impact on the planet. And to me, this is fascinating. 3.7% doesn't sound like a lot, but it's the equivalent to all of the aeroplane, uh, well, previous aeroplane uh, usage. So 
the actions that we take in a digital space, the design of our digital experiences has, again, just like the physical products that are in our lives, a far reaching impact on the planet. And to me, this is what is so exciting about sustainability and circular economy and design is that we have the agency and capacity as creative people in the world to conceptualize a different way of doing things and to provide solutions that eliminate those pollutions and waste entirely from the system. And that's really what this whole idea is about. And I want to break it down a little bit here. So the concept of the circular economy is that there are two main cycles at play. So as I already explained, nature, it kind of needs to metabolize everything. It needs to take back the building blocks of life um, in, order, in order to create new life. So that's the biological side. The biological side is really... Um, is really about all of the natural materials, things that have not been processed too extensively by humans. So, um, you know, this, this nice coffee cup here, it's made out of ceramics over time, a very long time, I might add, that would able to be broken down in a benign way and contributed back to the planet. Whereas any of the technical products that we've created, the things that have different materials, they will take longer because they have been transformed so dramatically from the natural uh, state. And so then we need to design them to fit within this technical sphere, which is basically, uh, you know, re repair, recycle, remanufacture, find a way of closing the loop so that those materials can be recycled and they can be recaptured in ways that maximize the value of the planet. Now, I've just been doing a lot of um, uh, uh, research recently because I created this report that just came out last week all about what's affecting this decade. We are, even before COVID, we were living in a time where a lot of um, mega trends were starting to affect the cultural shifts within our society. So society is always changing. Culture is always adapting. We've got millennials to being taken over as the world's biggest uh, population by numbers from the baby boomers. And so that's also having a shift in the way we want to work and the way we move around our cities, the values that we have. And so what we found was that there were these uh, driving mega driving forces, these mega trends that were affecting business. And, and as designers, creatives, as people working at the intersection between you know the economy and how p humans interact with the world, we have the opportunity to kind of think about these megatrends as the the um, the kind of underlying forces that are affecting the way we create what we do. So right now, for example, risk mitigation came to the forefront when BlackRock, the world's uh, biggest investment company, came out in January this year and stated that they wouldn't invest in any companies that weren't taking action on climate change, having this huge ripple effect around the world. And that's partly because climate change is a huge risk, a huge risk to infrastructure, to workers' um, safety, um, the ability for us to produce food or to even um, assets like infrastructure and buildings because of the, you know, I just saw in the news that there were whole cliffs with houses being washed away because of uh, rising sea levels. So if you want to read more about this, I, I created a report. It's completely free. You can grab it online um, about the future of workplace sustainability, but looked at all of these different trends that were affecting uh, the way we work. And I also developed this diagnostic toolkit because what I've learned in the um, you know, a couple decades of doing this, of advancing sustainability through design, is that you need a pathway to figure out where to go. And so this kind of helps you within your office, within your work environment, to reflect and figure out what it is that you can do in order to take action. Because you might think that this doesn't apply to you, but let me give you three reasons why it does. One, you have to breathe. Everybody has to breathe. Therefore, we all require photosynthesis, which is, um, you know, the magic of turning uh, sunlight via trees and photoplankton into oxygen. We all have to eat. Who doesn't love food? And food, it requires healthy soils and a stable climate in order to be produced. And the third is that things like um, COVID have been directly related to the ecosystem destruction and climate change that has come about as our collective action. So if we want to have a future that doesn't involve this really restrictive and chaotic life that we're living, then we need to figure out how to live within the natural systems of the world. And something like the Paris Agreement is helping kind of set government agendas and goals around that, which is really exciting to see how important it is for 
certain countries and certainly the European Union has been really progressive in this, especially now with COVID as well, like this building back through a green economy. But how do you go about doing this? So I created a method called the disruptive design method, which I'm going to share with you. And I describe it as a scaffolding, just like a building going up. It requires this kind of skeleton on the outside to support it. This is a scaffolding to learning how to think about the world's problems in more systemic and sustainable ways and to be able to solve design problems through sustainability. So it goes through these uh, three stages of mining, landscaping and building. Mining is where we um, basically explore the problem without trying to solve it. We look for all the little parts that make it up. We do systems thinking in a very kind of um, uh, interactive way and we use those tools to build a model of how the existing system works. That's the landscaping phase. We come and we look at it from a bird's eye view. Remember when you used to fly in airplanes and you would look down and you would see the lay of the land? Well, that's the landscaping phase. It's about trying to understand how the relationships between the systems work. And from that, we then apply a traditional design um, process of building. We build solutions that fit the problem because by now we've actually really understand what is the driving forces within that problem set so we can address it in a more sustainable way. Because for most of us, we have been taught and we exist in this world where we see the most obvious part of the system. This is called the iceberg model from systems thinking. And basically what it says is that the majority of our obvious parts of the system, the tip of the iceberg, are just evident to us because of the patterns, the structures, and ultimately the mental models. The way we see the world impacts how we understand it. That's why it's so important to disrupt our own way of thinking, to challenge ourselves to live and be differently in this world that we are all participating in. And the way I describe this is going from this one-dimensional perspective of the world. We all look at the horizon. We walk around on our two legs seeing this one, one kind of plane, but the world is 3D. And so this idea of being able to expand your mind and think through um, the infinite possibilities of a telescope and the reality that when you look through a microscope, what's inside the, you know, on a little piece of uh, glass will look almost identical to what's inside a telescope. Nature repeats patterns. Everything is interconnected and the, being able to see these two perspectives uh, changes our view from this linear one-dimensional viewpoint to this circular, holistic, dynamic, and interconnected. And this is where the role of systems thinking comes in. The world is systems. We are a system. We are part of uh, you know, socially constructed ones. Uh, we are also part of these dynamic ecosystems that exist around us. And the approach to systems thinking isn't just looking at, um, you know, the whole picture and the kind of chaotic mess of the whole picture. It's being able to see the way the parts exist within that whole and how you uh, can interact with those parts to change the whole. So the, the basic shift is going from looking at, you know, silos and kind of broken up pieces of the puzzle to looking at the whole puzzle first and seeing how each piece could come together. And ultimately, we use systems thinking in multiple ways in this kind of um, design set of um, uh, the disruptive design method and kind of being a, a creative change maker um, to understand how things function within the system. And when we're designing, we all know that we respond to a brief that tends to ask us for a function. It tends to say to us like, well, we want this functionality to exist in the world. So we can reconfigure around the function if we understand how it exists. So systems thinking is really about understanding the relationships that exist between things, breaking down the silos, looking at um, uh, synthesis as the tool that we apply. So taking all the information, uh, understanding the relationships, and then being able to imp uh, kind of apply an, an entirely new perspective on the problem. But ultimately, it's about relationships. It's the connective tissue between those obvious parts of the system that really have the capacity to make change. And that's what we're seeking out when we use systems thinking. We're seeking out the things that are not obvious to us, but that have the opportunity to be leveraged to really significantly change the way people interact with the world and the way we value the things around us. But there is a warning in this. And that is that from a systems mindset, we understand, just as I said about creating addictive technology, it's very easy to shift the burden of responsibility to somewhere else in the system. We see this all the time. Recycling is a classic example of this, where companies that have, uh, companies, <laughs> countries that have a lot of money, companies too, I guess, uh, companies that have a lot of money, they basically pay emerging economies to process their waste and often in pretty um, environmentally dangerous and subhazard ways. So what we're trying to do here is understand how the problem exists, look at the relationship between them by mapping the system, 
systems, understand how we can leverage change within that, and then design an entirely new approach to that problem so that the old problem no longer exists. We make it obsolete. And that's where these circular design approaches can come in. So obviously we have these, um, this tool that, you know, in our tool belt as designers, the transformational process that is design. And there are multiple different tools that we can apply with the overlay of sustainable design, right? So we can we can dematerialize. We can, for example, the web, web pages that are using darker colors use less energy than those that use lighter colors. There are d active strategies that reduce those um, invisible impacts that I was talking about. And so knowing about those and applying them in your day-to-day -day practice, Excellent. That's one tool. But then there's also this ability to see the work that you do in your design profession as part of this bigger system of influencing society, but also the work you do as a member of a company, an organization, as a community, that we have this goal of moving towards a polluting and wasteful society to one that is about zero waste. But conceptually, that means that we eliminate waste from the system. And here are some of the ways we do that. Repair. Making sure that if, you know, there's this old saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, but fix it if it is broke rather than throw it out. Um, and we're seeing a lot of companies offer this as part of their business model. So you can go into a Patagonia store and have your clothes repaired rather than uh, throwing them out. Remanufacture. This is the idea that you can make products so that they are modular, so that they can be taken apart and the valuable parts that still work can be reconfigured to fit within a new product. We also have the concept of reselling markets, and we're seeing this. IKEA in Canada, you can take a picture of the old um, uh, desk that you brought that you no longer want and resell it back to IKEA. They will actually take a look at it, offer you some money, come and pick it up, and then resell it in their store. We're also seeing these resale markets, obviously, with high-end fashion and other parts of the economy sharing platforms. Um, here in London, there's a, a, a tool library where you can go and borrow a drill because who really needs one of them for more than a few minutes in its lifetime? Looking at the waste that we produce as a resource for another part of the system and then optimizing for those resources to be used in more um, higher value ways. And extending the life of products, making things durable and having longevity. This doesn't just apply to physical products. This is also applying to the way in which we, the philosophy or ideology that we apply to our design in the digital or experiential world. And then, of course, buying circular products. The more we can invest in circular products, whether it be in our offices, in our homes, the more we can encourage this kind of in, um, change in industry. We obviously want to recover resources, making sure that things are not um, lost from the system. Recycling does not necessarily give us the best solution all the time. We want to maintain things in their state so that their functionality can kind of give us a longer term value. And one of the key things of the circular economy is this idea of transitioning from a product where you buy it, it goes into the economy, you use it, and then you waste it, that linear model, into one where it's an, a relationship. It's a product service system, meaning the product is designed within a service that delivers part of a whole system. And as service designers, those of you who are, this is an amazing opportunity to figure out how you can create uh, higher value propositions for your customers and clients. A great example of this is the collaboration between Unilever and TerraCycle. They created Loop, which is an at-home delivery service where they've designed reusable high value packaging that can be refilled. And so you basically buy into it. It's partnered with local um, retailers and those products come to your house, like ice cream in aluminium, um, reusable containers, and then obviously they take them back, they, they um, sterilize them and refill them again. And what this is showing us is that if we change the way we view that functionality and that relationship between the elements of the system, if we flip the script on how we deliver products and value and motivation, then we can change the way we do things. So one tool of this is gamification, which I'm sure you're all quite familiar with, but let me explain it in the context of sustainability. So gamification is using game mechanics in non-gaming environments. So these mechanisms of motivation. But game theory is the economist theory of understanding why and how humans interact in the economy the way we do. And there has to be these four aspects of that. You have to have people, people who are willing to interact with that system. You have to have rules because rules create the foundations for how to operate. There needs to be consequences of some description, rewards or punishments, and some sort of payoff. And the thing is, is that as humans, we are incredibly motivated by 
by the reward that these kinds of systems give us. And we're also motivated by the fear of socially being ostracized or having not achieved something that society expects us to achieve. So we can use these elements in very um, respectful and appropriate ways. We can design these systems where the mechanics motivate particular actions, um, such as transitioning from a very wasteful system to one that is renewable and sustainable by making it desirable, by making it exciting and rewarding. So we can basically encourage these cultural shifts towards sustainability in the circular economy by and I say respectfully, um, uh, engaging people with the alternative system. But there is, of course, the old human brain, and we have to figure out how to make sure that we overcome some of the gnawing barriers. Now, like I said, I've been doing this for a number of years, and I have encountered the full gamut of reasons of why and how one individual should not take action to help address these problems. My favorite is just that it's somebody else's responsibility, deflecting the power or agency or locus of control onto the boss that doesn't ask you to do it or the client that tells you not to do it. In my mind, everybody has the capacity and potential to affect change and especially creatives because literally people hire us to solve their problems. So we have this opportunity to overcome the fear that they might have that taking some sort of pioneering action is going to um, result in. So the human mind is a natural aversion to anything that induces fear. The limbic system deep inside our brain, that pink bit in there is essentially the emotional powerhouse that controls most of our actions. We think it's our cerebral cortex, but it's actually not. In fact, the majority of our um, decisions are made in this limbic system. There are about 90% uh, cognitive scientists say are made in the limbic system and 10% up here in the front bit where we think. So that's telling you something. Ultimately, what happens is as we encounter fear or as we encounter experiences that we don't know, things that are a bit confronting, we often shut down and we go into this like, I don't want to deal with it mode. And we see that over and over again. And one of the reasons is because our brains is filling in the blanks before we even have the chance to cognitively think it. And you guys know this because you're designing experiences that help direct people through a website or whether it be through a service experience. And so we can leverage this to encourage people to see the opportunity that engaging with different systems has. But we need to also know the cognitive biases. These are the mental glitches that we all share. And by understanding how we can um, kind of uh, circumnavigate some of those, we can start to design really um, I guess, rewarding systems of sustainability. Because I think as well, historically, a lot of the the things that we've created have been a little bit, um, is just, I don't know if this translates, in Australia we say naff, like just not cool. Um, and I think a part of that is because there's a legacy issue of this idea that sustainability, the planet, you know, it's some sort of opt-in, like you know, the idea from the 70s of, you know, hippies hugging trees and things, it's just so non, um, it doesn't apply anymore. We live in an entirely different world. We've created technology that has, you know, completely transformed our entire world. Yet we still operate with this idea that the systems, like the 17,000 breaths of oxygen I have to breathe in every day for my body to keep existing and for my brain to work, has not, um, does not require me to make action within that system, to me to be respecting the trees. And I don't know, it sounds like, I do sound like a hippie when I start saying that though, that's the only problem you see. Cognitive bias. So this is the thing. We have all these biases or preconceived ideas that influence the way we see the world, like cognitive uh, confirmation bias. So this happens like when you're Googling and you see a bunch of information that doesn't reaffirm what you already believe. So you just, uh, your brain ignores it. It's like, nah, don't want to know about it. And this is why we have such polarization around topics like climate change, because people like to get in their corner and not absorb any information that tells them otherwise. There's actually a great one called the Danny Kruger effect, named after one of the recent Nobel Prize winning economists that essentially argues that um, when somebody thinks they know something, they actually become so uh, rigid in thinking that they know it that they think that they're the best at it and they won't get any more information about it, even if they're completely wrong. 
So this effect of being like, I'm the best at this, I don't need, I can think of some political leaders who think that way. Um, but also we have this uh, compelling problem where we have an optimism and a negativity bias. The negativity bias is where information that is not good has a double negative weight on our mind. So when you're scrolling through social media and you see all of the horrific things that are going on in the world, it affects us longer than when you see something positive. But then we have something called the optimism bias, which is where our brains can't help but imagine that in the worst case scenario, bad things won't happen to you or me. We, well, me specifically. My brain protects me and those that I love. So that means that when we, when we see the catastrophic effects of climate change in Canada, Canada, California and Canada, and we think, well, that's not my world, it's very easy for our brain to imagine that we're going to be able to somehow miraculously save ourselves from the impending doom. So that is, these kinds of biases play out to affect how we operate in the economy and how we ultimately interact or don't interact with things, say, deciding to design sustainably and operating in a way that is ethical within your company and ensuring that you have, like the last speaker, you know, the right diversity policy and not saying, well, we're too small or using these excuses to kind of avoid the reality that we are all participating in this system. Um, one of my other co favorite cognitive biases is loss aversion and um, sunk cost. So loss aversion is like, it, it hurts us double when we are experiencing a loss, like if you lose money, it hurt, like you just it lasts longer the pain. But my favorite is this idea of when you um, when you invest some time or money or resources in something, and you get to a point where you realize that it's no longer going to happen. Like you're standing in a queue, it's going to take forever to get to the end, but you've already spent all this time, and you're looking back down the line, and you're thinking, I don't want to lose what I've invested. And that whole concept means that people often get stuck in this kind of rigid status quo because they're so invested in what they've invested in rather than considering changing the way they see that, that, that well, I spent this time, I can make a conservative effort to say, this is probably not the best thing for me now. And as humans, we do respond to those that are around us. We are social animals. And I loved how the last speaker talked about this idea of modeling the diversity by representation. We follow people around us, whether we like it or not. Even the most rebellious leader is seeing how other people interact, looking at media, seeing representation, and that is creating this, in that limbic system, these models of how the world works. So if we have more people engaging in sustainability in the design practice and you know being more uh, pioneering in the way they do things, then it ultimately creates that normalization of those practices. Whew, I know. I told you, you better have had coffee. Okay, I'm about to wrap up what I've got to say to you today. But I also thought about how you guys listening to this are part of ecosystems. You are part of your workplace and your companies and your organizations and your client relationships. And so I wanted to share with you some recent work that I've been doing on how to activate sustainability in the workplace and in business activities. So the way I describe it, is there are three main areas where you, me, and everybody else in the professional world has an impact. So I run a small company, we have impacts, operational, how we do our business, the products we create, and the experiences or services that we design. Wrong way. So the way I, just, I, I wanna break this down for you is that every action that we take has an impact, right? So this is the operational, and this is the kind of boring stuff. This is the energy services we buy, the water we use to flush the loos, the waste we produce, it's the infrastructure that we're participating in, whether the buildings are insulated or all this kind of jazz. It's the procurement of goods and services, like the coffee pods, don't use them, don't use French presses. Um, Six billion coffee pods in the US uh, have been and go to landfill. Anyway, I'm going to go on coffee pod random tangent. Travel, which we all know has basically dramatically changed. Um, and of course, all of these factors, they fit into the what we call the environmental management set. They're essentially the general inputs to your business operations that you can get the bills, you can do an audit, you can buy green energy, you can you know, change the infrastructure so that you have a lower footprint in your day-to-day -day activities in your business and operations. Then there's the product side of things. That's the stuff that we create, whether it be the digital um, 
products or physical products. They all participate in supply chains. Who are your servers? Are they green servers? Who are your um, other service providers? The companies that you, you you know use to interact with your clients are they are they buying green servers? The materials that you use in order to achieve your jobs, because at the end of the day you're buying technology to build the websites. You are actually participating in quite broad supply chains. Obviously, if you are designing products, the packaging, as well as the retail environment, the customer use, the end of life, and this all fits within um, this kind of supply chain sustainability, understanding how the things that we do in the supply chain have impacts on people's lives and on the, the natural world. And then experiential. That is how we curate the cognitive experience of those that come to our service. If you're, you're probably not a hotel, but let's say you were a hotel. We all know as customers that all the small details dramatically affect our whole, you know, desire to be in that space. Where the bed linen, you know, if there's plastic water bottles versus beautiful, you know, reusable ones, these all affect our experience. So experiential impacts are really important for figuring out how to create a lower impact offering to customers. Now, all of this fits within the quite boring but very important concept of corporate social responsibility. And this doesn't just apply to large corporations anymore. Everybody who basically exists um, in, in the kind of business world should be making sure that they have some sort of policies and practices that reduce the impact of their actions. And uh, one tool to do that in the product area is life cycle thinking. It's an ability to understand how things happen across the supply chain, how they interact with the natural world. Here's an example of mapping supply chain impacts. I know that some of this stuff is kind of boring for creatives, but you're all participating in the economy. Therefore, we all have the ability to understand, to mind the problem, to look at the relationships, to see where we have agency and to make decisions to affect change. If this is something you're interested in, I have like a huge program now that we're running to try and help businesses on this journey to transform the way they do things. And one of the reasons we do this is because everybody has a sphere of influence. Everybody has the capacity to affect the people around them. And that's not just for designers, that's for all of us. And so I really feel like if we can act our own agency, we can think differently, we can see the world for its magic and the beauty, and we can see that we are all participating in the future by designing it, then we can appreciate and respect what opportunities we have to all keep, um, keep this world as beautiful as we have it today, and if not better in the future through the choices we make every day of our lives. So I want to thank you so much for listening to me. I wish I was with you all physically there, but now we are learning how to be adaptive and resilient people in this new world we live in. So I hope that that's inspired some thoughts and, and ideas. And yeah, I look forward to, to uh, taking some questions.